Okay, good evening everyone. Welcome to ACE 15. We'll go ahead and get started even though there are a number of people still over there ignoring us as we flash the lights and announce that they're supposed to be over here. But um, I'm sure they will be joining us in just a few minutes. Um, I want to welcome you and thank you for being at ACE 15. ACE, uh, this is actually the 15th annual ACE. So it's been 15 years we've been doing this program. And being entrepreneurs, of course, we love taking that risk of doing a big event at the end of January, hoping that we don't have bad weather. And so far, we've been pretty lucky. It was a little dicey last year, but uh, you know, this year was not too bad. I'd like to kick off by welcome, uh, thanking our program committee um, as many of you may imagine, this uh, takes quite a bit of work to pull this together. So for those of you that are on the program committee that are here in the room, if you would stand up so we could acknowledge you and thank you for all your hard work. <laughs> and of course, uh, another big group to thank is our sponsors. Uh, without their financial support and their energy and efforts, we obviously would not be here. Um, our lead sponsors this evening are Michigan Economic Development Corporation, MEDC, and Brinks uh, Gilson Leone, the intellectual property law firm. Both have been very good sponsors of ACE for many years, and we're very thrilled to have them back again this year. Some other key sponsors that have been with us for quite some time include Raymond, Automation Alley, Ann Arbor Spark, and we're happy to have Comcast Business back with us this year, and also the Zell Lurie Institute from the University of Michigan. New to us this year, Atomic Object, and, um, and Howard & Howard Law Firm. So um, I hope you had the opportunity to meet all of our sponsors in the exhibit hall. And just as a quick aside, I'd like to tell you about a couple of programs that are going on at Automation Alley in Ann Arbor Spark. Automation Alley has a new program. You may have read about it. It's called the Seven Cs, and it's a program to help advanced manufacturing companies get um, a leg up on their businesses. And they will be giving you support in accelerating your commercialization, and they will also be um, putting you through a customized seven-step process hence the name Seven Cs, that includes intense coaching and a firm commitment from Automation Alley to invest resources and capital in your venture. So if you're a fit for this program, please contact Automation Alley. Also, Ann Arbor Spark has their um, entrepreneurial boot camp coming up in uh, March, on March 25th and 26th. There's a kickoff on February 17th. And for those of you that are new to the entrepreneurial ecosystem, the Ann Arbor Spark Boot Camp has been going on, I think, as long as ACE. I know I was involved with it many years ago, so it is, uh, continues to evolve. It's a very exciting program that will help your business get traction. In addition to our sponsors, I'd like to thank our panelists today, our moderators, and our experts serving in the Consultants Corridor and, of course, our ACE Challenge judges that you're going to meet in a few minutes and our exhibitors. Um, all of you help make this event come alive. And a special thank you to our keynote speaker this evening, Jules Pieri, who traveled to be here with us and who battled snow drifts on the East Coast um, that fortunately missed us here in Michigan. Um, we, had, we were fortunate to get Jules to come and she was introduced to us uh, through Crane's Detroit Business. She was one of the homecoming expats that uh, visited Michigan and, and has um, agreed to give back to the state and to help our entrepreneurs here, and that's why she's here tonight. Um, last but not least, I want to thank Chris Holman, our MC, and of course the event would not be the same without him. Now it's my pleasure to ask Eric Sosenko to say a few words about his firm's commitment to entrepreneurship in Michigan. Eric is an IP attorney with our lead sponsor, Brinks Gilson Leon. Thanks, Diane. Uh, first of all, I'd like to welcome everybody to ACE 15. Uh, we were sitting here thinking, trying to think about how long it has been that this has been going on and realize it does coincide with the year. So the 15 up there isn't really 15th annual, it's just 2015. 
I think I missed the first 10, and I hate to say that. It seems kind of embarrassing because she asked me to talk about commitment. <laughs> and, but I did. I missed the first 10. I came and attended one, and I think we have been sponsors for the last four of the main sponsors. And I, I can say without a doubt that this is one of the best entrepreneurial events uh, going on in the state. And so as an intellectual property attorney, and I speak for the other 20 attorneys we have here in the state of Michigan, that uh, you guys really inspire us. So our commitment pales in comparison to the commitment that the entrepreneurs have here. So I would like to welcome you to ACE and thank you for all you do. Uh, without you, this couldn't go on. And, you know, let's just keep it going for as long as we can. So thanks again and welcome. For those of you that have attended ACE for the last seven years, tonight's MC needs no introduction. In fact, I was tempted to, to just ask the audience, is there anyone here who doesn't already know Chris Holman? Because introducing him always feels kind of funny because I think he probably knows more people in the state than anyone. He started the uh, Greater Lansing Business Monthly out of the trunk of his car in 1987 and has been promoting the Michigan business community ever since. He's hosted a variety of radio and TV shows and continues to host a statewide radio show, The Michigan Business Beat, through the Michigan Talk Network. He is the CEO of Michigan Business Network and founding partner of Michigan Celebrate Small Business. Chris has served as <laughs> Michigan Small Business Advocate and is the past chairman of the National Small Business Association, the oldest small business advocacy organization in the United States. Please welcome Chris Holman back to ACE. <laughs> yeah, I, I thought it was interesting that Diane said uh, it, it wouldn't be the same without Chris Holman. She didn't say it wouldn't be better. She didn't say it wouldn't be worse. She said it wouldn't be the same. Um, but thank you, Diane. Thank you for having me here. I appreciate it. Guys like me really appreciate the work, quite frankly. Um, I have done this uh, a number of years, and just this announcement, when I was chair of the National Small Business Association, I was actually in the Rose Garden with the president when he signed the jobs bill. Now, the beauty of that is, because we had lobbied very hard for that, is crowdfunding, if you remember, was part of that. So the interesting sidebar is, we still don't have crowdfunding on a national level because the SEC hasn't figured out the regulations, but we do have it in the state of Michigan where our governor said, look, we need this, let's get going. So that tells you a little bit about the influence I had at the national level. Uh, in the past, we have uh, done this as kind of an elevator speech, uh, in front of a coffee shop, a number of different ways. Well, this way, this year, we're going to try something a little differently. I was a little concerned because I've been miscast this year as a, uh, a professor of entrepreneurship. Um, and, and the people that are going to be sitting up here are my students in the class. And so they're going to come up one at a time and do, at this podium, a, a three-minute, basically elevator speech, trying to get our esteemed panel of judges to then give them the award as the best presentation tonight. And the beauty about that best presentation, and they're going to do these for three minutes each, and the judges are then going to have, cumulatively for each speaker, uh, each presenter, two questions that they can ask. Uh, the beauty is that these good folks uh, collected early on their paper routes, they mowed extra lawns, they came up with $5,000 that will go to tonight's winner. So there is something very much at stake here. So at this point in time, I'm going to introduce... <laughs> Terry, you came up with the whole 5,000. I saw everybody <laughs> hitting your back. Thanks. Um, so let me, uh, let me introduce the panel of judges. And uh, when I introduce you, if you would stand, do kind of the Queen's Wave thing. No, no, no don't get rowdy, Terry. Um, so with that, uh, Jack Aarons, if you would start us off, managing partner at TGAP Ventures, vice chair of the MyQuest Board of Directors. Jack, good to have you here. Uh, Terry Cross, who's here, uh, actually connected to me because uh, watching Terry is part of my community service. Um, he's an angel investor and an early stage advisor. Does a wonderful job. Very good. Uh, Paula Cunningham from Capital National Bank, no stranger to entrepreneurs. Uh, 
uh, former president of a community college, by the way, as well. Uh, Jody Vanderwell from Grand Angels. Jody, it's good to have you back again. Jo Jody's actually here so the three guys can copy off someone. Um, Nick Wurzler from uh, Augment Ventures. And Nick, thank you for your time. So now we'll call the presenters up here by name and company and they'll take a seat and then we'll bring them up one at a time to do their three minutes. Uh, first up here, John Lopez from uh, Microsite. John, if you'd make your way up. Uh, from Clevis Seneca, David Porter. All right, then from uh, Health Numeric, Nevin Britton. From uh, Transcuro, Lauren Shampo. Did, did I get that right? You're looking. Oh, wow. Uh -huh. Four years of foreign language. <laughs> Happened to be English, but. <laughs> Brock Leibowitz, and he is here from Seatside Service. Brock, where are you? I can't believe you couldn't order yourself up here from your seat. Right, there you go. Hi, Brock. <laughs> How are you doing? Uh, and Kevin uh, Kessler from uh, Assist Bio. Kevin. And from Exodynamics, Marshall Quadja. From Mountain Labs, Alex Vanderkolk. And finally, uh, Valerie Obenchain from Advanced Interactive Response Systems. Okay. So students, let's get started. Don't be nervous. Your final grade depends on this presentation. Where are we? Oh. Hard to count the ten. I'll introduce myself. Uh, Annie, I'm, I'm sorry, you've been disqualified. <laughs> <laughs> All right, here it is, final page, sorry. Andy Zimmerman from uh, Civionics. Andy. That's a good thing now, that makes you noteworthy, right? All right, good. All right. All right, so first student up, John Lopez from Microsoft. John? Thank you. Good evening. My name is uh, Dr. John Lopez, President of Microsoft Incorporated. We have developed a new platform technology to replace products which are toxic. We're using food grade ingredients, the products meant for agriculture, food processing, healthcare, and personal care products. We got recommendation our product uh, we a company was recommended by EPA for presidential green chemistry award we received two SBIR awards from NASA and NIH we have 10 patents and one of our product has been selected by NASA for the Mars mission our mission is to replace toxic products using food grade microbicidal products. Toxic products such as chlorine, hydrogen peroxide, paracetic acid, and others which produce carcinogenic free radicals and byproducts. Microsat has products and product candidates in each of the categories. We can replace all of them. Besides, Microsat is venturing into different areas like Food contamination increases lot of infections, causes about four, uh, 40 million infections per year in the country. Out of that, 120,000 hospitalizations. Out of that, 3,000 deaths. Then there are numerous food recalls because of bacterial contamination. We want to replace all this with our product so that we can have a very healthy lifestyle for the people. The other part, now with this, we can say that there are 190,000 grocery stores and 10,000 
supermarkets in the country, these are our potential customers. Hospital infection costs a lot of expenses. One patient infection in the hospital costs upwards from $20,000. Accumulated infection costs about $35 to $47 billion. With our products like ProSan, sanitizers, and silky soft skin, and hand sanitizers, we can reduce the infection rate and food contamination. Right now, we have uh, our products are sold by. Pardon? Time's up. Oh, I would uh, welcome anybody who is like to meet us to discuss with our products. So uh, micro, uh, microbicide manufacture safe and effective microbicidal products for food processing, healthcare, agricultural, and personal care. Uh, next up uh, from Clava Syndica is uh, David Porter. Oh, God. Questions. It's always about you guys. Okay. I'm back up. Two questions. Yeah, I guess uh, I have more of a comment than a question. Uh, up until Chris finished it up, I really didn't have a clue what you did. Can you oh, use some you mic? talked a lot about you know the industry and what you're going after, but you really didn't tell us what you were offering, what the product really was. We have developed a new technology to make products using only food grade ingredients, so that they are non toxic and uh, replace all the toxic products. All right, uh, another question? Yes. Yeah. Who are your competitors and how are you different from them? Our competitors are Clorox, Ecolab, Clorox, which is chlorine, Ecolab, which is parasitic acid, and other people uh, like Lysol use these uh, quaternary compounds, and people using uh, triclosan in the soaps. We have to replace all these with our product, which are very uh, friendly economically as well as uh, in the environmentally friendly products. Thanks, John. Thank you. All right, next up uh, from Clavicinica, Dave Porter. Uh, Clavicinica is a leading developer of innovative software solutions for learners of Chinese. The software is used at the University of Michigan, Cornell, and dozens of schools and colleges across the country. Clavicinica is currently ramping up development of an integrated Chinese literacy training platform that is expected to have a major disruptive effect on the Chinese language learning market. David? I'm David Porter, and as you can tell from my fashionable tweet attire, I'm actually a literature professor at the University of Michigan. I'm also the uh, founder of the educational software company, Clavis Seneca. I'm here today to introduce a mobile app that will transform the way English speakers learn Chinese. China is now America's second largest trading par partner, and Americans are scrambling to learn the language. The trouble is, learning to, Chinese, to read Chinese at over even a basic level requires the mastery of over 1,500 distinct characters, with very little progress to show along the way. Uh, <clears throat> this is an exercise in, in, in tedious rote memorization that leaves a lot of students in despair, trying to read, until you reach this level of 1,500 characters, trying to read even a basic Chinese uh, text message is an exercise in, 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 in total frustration, a bit like trying to read a, an English message knowing only the first nine letters of the alphabet. <clears throat> so uh, in, so uh, our mobile app solution is intended to help me as a language learner uh, overcome these barriers to achieve my learning goals. Our app, our basic premise behind the app is that learning to read a second language, the best way to do it is the same way you learn to read your first language. That is through guided reading practice using engaging text carefully calibrated to the learner's current reading level. Our app combines assessment, 
uh, guided reading, vocabulary training, and on-demand tutorial services to provide a fully customized learning experience that replaces the tedium of rote memorization with the familiar pleasures of reading. The Chinese economy is now the fastest growing in the world, and the smart money knows that Chinese is the language to learn in the 21st century. College language enrollments in uh, Chinese have been doubling every decade, and successful companies like Rosetta Stone and Chinese Pod have demonstrated that there are millions of dollars to be made in the Chinese language learning space. These companies, though, focus only on conversational Chinese. Our product is unique in its focus on Chinese language reading skills, and we have what it takes to make this product succeed. In 19 years as a University of Michigan faculty member, I've worked with dozens of uh, Chinese language instructors at U of M and beyond to develop software solutions uh, based on sound pedagogical research and real classroom experience. Custom editions of our mobile apps have already been commissioned by three major textbook publishers and uh, 15 colleges and universities. Our research demonstrates that the total addressable market for our, pr our product is in excess of 1 million customers uh, with a uh, growth rate of 15%. We intend initially to target uh, college students and adult independent learners um, <clears throat> for, uh, with a uh, subscription-based revenue model that we will use to capture 5% of this market within three years. To recap, we are building out uh, technology with a proven track record to solve one of the most formidable educational challenges facing English speakers in the Chinese century. We'd welcome the chance to speak with anyone here who can help us meet this challenge. Okay, so we, All right, we have a couple of questions from the floor. Paula? How have you measured the effectiveness of your, your mobile app? <clears throat> Uh, components of our mobile app have already been deployed at the University of Michigan and Cornell University. We've worked carefully with the instructors there to establish quantitative metrics based on student scores, student exams, and student evaluations, and that's the basis for our um, claims to the eff efficacy of the software. Okay. Uh, what is your revenue model? The revenue model for the platform is um, subscription-based, so uh, users will buy into this library of, of graded texts at a rate of $15 to $25 a month, uh, and uh, it's the same model that's used by one of our competitors, Chinese Pod, um, very effectively. All right. Good. Good question. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up from uh, Health Numeric, uh, Nevin Britton. Health Numeric provides home care agencies, insurers, and care transition organizations with an innovative in-home patient monitoring solution with a platform to help patients' care teams collaborate and respond to patients' needs. So next up, Nevin Britton. Hello, my name is Nevin Britton, and I'm the founder of Health Numeric. My grandmother died from uncontrolled diabetes. She lived a very good life, but then died from that disease because it was unmanaged. Now, myself, I grew my business based on, I grew Health Numeric based on that experience, my personal experience and my experience as an engineer for 20 years. I created Health Numeric in, in the primary purpose because this damn health system, it was broke. It is broke. But now, and only now, is it starting to change based on a preventative model, okay? So at this point, I created Health Numeric in the in-home patient monitoring category. We created a whole new category un inside of in-home in patient monitoring based on a care circle concept. Let me explain how a care circle works based on my experience with my customers. My customers, one of my customers was released from the hospital. She transitioned from the hospital to home. In the home is the most critical time in that 30-day period before you go back to the hospital and you may experience a readmission rate and then the hospital is penalized. That's based on gov the government's regulations. So what we did, we incorporated our devices in her home. She was able to monitor herself on a day-to-day -day basis. Our care circle, which combines the care team to receive that information and then deliver that information in such a way that everyone can collaborate. She then measured herself on a day-to-day -day basis. We put her daughter in that care circle, her nurse, and her physician. Her daughter lived in California, and she transitioned from Michigan to California. But every day that her mother took her measurements, she was able to see a measurement. Every single time that measurement was taken, she realized something, that during her mother's measurement, that her experience with her CHF, her condition, 
was changing at a certain time of the day. She notified the nurse based on that condition, and then they collaborated inside of my platform to determine that a specific time of the day they should adjust her oxygen schedule. They changed her oxygen schedule, and she was no longer going back to the hospital. That changed everything. She was no longer being re readmitted into the hospital. She knew what she, she was a healthier individual, and they cut her medication in half based on my care circle and the collaboration inside that care circle. So me, my company, Health Numeric, is defining that category. We work with our customers who include home care, hospitals, and insurance agencies to develop care circles for individuals who need this support. And based on their success, each person is able to continue their life in an effective way. We have, we, in-home patient monitoring is a 18, will be an 18, I'm sorry, $28 billion, that will be a $10 billion um, uh, industry. Now, Health Numeric in itself, our company is growing, we have real customers, and we're successful at what we're doing. You got to be careful now. When she gives you the ten, that shouldn't change your figures. Okay, now. Yeah. <laughs> so it's a bigger industry than he told you. Okay. All right. So any questions? All right, Vic. What is the data collection method, and do you have this have to be all to customized per condition? Great, Great question. question. Based on each condition, there are kitted devices that go together based on that condition. So for CHF, for example, you can monitor a person's weight, blood pressure, and pulse ox. Those devices will send data wirelessly, wirelessly, look, dry. That information is then sent to our cloud solution, which notifies the individuals in that care circle. The care circle can then respond accordingly based on our algorithms and the specific design action plans of that care circle. Jack. Sorry. Ready? Yeah. You know, I was just going to make an announcement. Make sure you turn off your wristwatch. <laughs> smart device. I'm in the smart category. <laughs> so it sounds like there must be a lot of equipment involved here, then, right? If everything is, is tied back in wirelessly to your system, does the hey, who pays for that? Does the patient have to buy the equipment? Actually, no. The efficiencies and effectiveness. It it's, uh, helps reduce the cost of care. So insurers, home care, hospitals, physicians, they see a return on investment based on purchasing the equipment directly themselves. We have a direct sales model. So we, we define our category for our customer. They understand how, how to purchase directly from us and how we kit those devices and then deliver them to the customer's home. So it's a select group of wireless Bluetooth enabled devices that send that information across a wireless infrastructure to our cloud or care circle environment. And then the individuals are notified and then they can react and respond to that person's care so that those notifications do not transition to a higher level and they can react to that person's care right away. All right, good. Thanks, Nathan. Good job. You know, I, I, I would caution all of you, and I should have probably done this at the beginning, be cognizant of where the mic is. Very much like doing a bad presentation will disallow you to sell your product, doing one that isn't heard will do even more damage, right? So make sure you're in front of this mic when you talk. Um, next up, Lauren Chapo, uh, Transcuro has developed a, a simple to use web-based application for hospitals, post-acute care providers, and patients to navigate and discover the best quality care for their needs, utilizing objective databases and internally developed research-based risk assessment algorithm. Transcuro is able to match patients to the best quality post-acute care option that meets their needs. Yes, thank you. Yeah, we do a lot of stuff. Yes. I'm Lauren Shampo, founder and CEO of Transcuro. Seven and a half years ago, my family and I were in a horrible car accident when a car came crashing through our windshield. My daughter broke her neck, stopped breathing, and couldn't move. My son also broke his neck, fractured his skull, and had a head injury. With my injuries, I have never been more scared or focused in my entire life, before or since. After that nightmare, we faced a month-long hospital stay. We had amazing care. Even with our amazing care, 
each of us were readmitted multiple times. What I didn't know at that time is that the most important time when you're of that whole continuum is right that one week when you're leaving the hospital. Right when we left the hospital, right before, we knew we needed home health care. I got a list, a printed up list of 20 different providers. I was told to choose one. These were people that were going to be in my home 24 seven, which ended up being five months when I couldn't take care of my own kids. And I was told to choose one. That was the extent of the guidance I received, a non-recommendation. It was chaotic. And it was ugly. You know, people that understand healthcare know how ugly it can be. It leads to extensive costs and poor quality of care. $25 billion a year are wasted on these non recommendations and readmissions and poor quality of care. I knew I could do something about it. I'm a bit of a data nerd. I, I, I know where to find it, and I know the people that can help do that. TransCuro software solution can fix this problem. We have a proprietary algorithm that provides a personalized discharge plan for people. Hospitals need this. They want it and they'll actually pay for it. I mean, they are facing millions of dollars in penalties every single year because of the penalties that are imposed of the Affordable Care Act. And that's only one of the reasons they have to pay for it or are willing to. Patients certainly need it. I know I did. They need a path forward. They need some guidance. Investors want to be in front of this $200 million emerging market. There's no clear market leader in this right now. Not one. TransCuro's soft launch will be active in two months with a paying customer. I'm very excited about a paying customer. Um, And investors can expect um, accelerated growth by year's end. I'd love to talk to you more after all of these presentations because I'm not going anywhere, so find me. Um, And thank you. Appreciate it. All right, questions from the judges? Can you describe a little bit more your business model? How are you going to get paid for this? Mm -hmm. It's It's a software as a service, so we'll be selling to hospitals, and we'll be selling to the post-acute care facilities. So our beta testing, or our our soft launch, is actually going to be at a long-term care facility discharging out to home health care. And they're going to be paying a monthly fee to help simplify their services altogether. It helps decrease the length of time that their discharge planners and social workers will be spending on that. And then it also helps decrease the likelihood of readmission as well. So then that will help discharge those patients. So they want to pay for it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You have a really large, you have a really large uh, number of customers to address, and mm-hmm. it's unclear to me exactly how what your plan uh, for, for that sales cycle is, mm-hmm. and approximately how long is the sales cycle? Yeah. <laughs> Well, um, for the post-acute care market, if, that's another reason why we're starting there. For, if you're dealing with the post-acute care market, meaning long-term care facilities or sub-acute care facilities, it's a much shorter sales cycle. The decision makers are right there. They don't have to go through the hospital systems. Um, and as we are smaller, right, we are now, it'll be me and some of our board members that will help utilizing, leveraging some of their relationships. That will be how we're selling right now. We will eventually then work to um, 1099, some of our sales people working with that. And so the sales cycle for that is a couple of months. When you're talking about the hospitals, it can be 12 months to 18 months. What we're doing to shorten that sales cycle is actually, I mean, talks with a larger technology company, and we want to be able to leverage some of their relationships um, to get in there faster, quicker. Yeah, to get into their cha- to utilize their channels and and get in there because it's it makes a big difference because the sales cycle is so long, um, even when they want it. You know, I've been in healthcare sales for 15 years, so I've called on. Um, the healthcare organizations. I've called on the hospitals. I, you know, so I know that in general. And one of my um, advisory board members is a managing director at Accenture that focuses on health IT. So he has a lot of those relationships as well. So I'm working all of those types of angles. Thank you. Thanks, Lynn. Uh, 
Next up is Brock Leibowitz. Seatside service is a mobile application allowing guests at entertainment venues such as ballparks, arenas, etc., to order concessions and merchandise directly to their seat by using their smartphone. Welcome, Brock Leibowitz. Hey, everybody. Just hang on. You guys can hear me back there. My name is Barack Leibovitz, and I'm the founder, CEO, and chief delivery boy of Seatside Service. Uh, Seatside Service was an idea born out of frustration. I was at a local venue downtown. I had a poor experience. I was sun was beaming down on me. There was no vendor in my section. I waited and waited. Got up, waited in line even more. Juggled my order back to my seat and realized I missed the big play that I paid good money to see. So it was at this very moment where I was, aha, there has to be a better way to do this. How convenient would it be if I could use my smartphone? So I started doing a lot of research in the industry, and what we came to realize that it was no longer nice to have a mobile application for a sports team or, or Wi-Fi at a venue. The demographic is changing, and, and the users expect the ability to engage with these entertainment venues. So what we set out to do is we've developed the ultimate food service pl platform, technology platform, excuse me, for sports entertainment venues. And mobile vending is just one of those subset features that um, we drive. Uh, in addition to the mobile vending, we also have real-time analytics. Um, so you get to know who your customer is, who's your season ticket holder, what is their average cart size. And we also drive real-time real, real, uh, real -time push notifications. So if it's a seventh inning stretch and you have 10,000 hot dogs on your burner and you know 60% get spoiled out, you can push a notification, buy one, get one free, and engage your audience. So what we've set out to do is, is, is set up a win-win-win proposition. We've enhanced the guest experience for the fan, uh, we've improved the ballpark operations for the vendor, and we've ultimately increased the revenues uh, for the venue itself. So with our last season, our, over the course of the last year, we did our, our pilot with our, our first season really with the Toledo Mud Hens, and we were able to achieve a 44% lift in the average order size uh, versus our platform and their average order concession size. And then at the same time, we were able to showcase a $2.03 transaction fee. So we're utilizing a transaction-based business model right now. Sports, uh, based off the Sports Business Journal, uh, sports and entertainment concessions is a $14 billion market uh, headed by Aramark, Delaware North, Levy Restaurants, among other concessionaires who are sort of the gatekeepers. We've been able to showcase uh, incremental sales lifts of $100,000 plus, in addition to um, $200,000 in forecasted projections for the venue signing up. And that's just based off of the average venue size and their average attendance. So that's specific to the Toledo Mud Hens. Moving forward, um, we have a lot of pilots this quarter with Comerica Park, Detroit Red Wings. Um, NASCAR, MLS, which will be Red Bull Arena, which will be our first MLS team, and NCAA I just returned back from University of North Carolina, and we're excited about opportunities there. Um, we have over 20, 30 plus years of sports and entertainment experience. Um, their age ranges between 23 to 45, so we got the youth of energy and also the gray beard experience and the wisdom. So at this point, I'll open it up to questions from you guys, and feel free to come and chat with me afterwards. Thank you. No, we haven't. We originally, the story started out with a novelty search, and we engaged with Jaffe on that, and then we realized that there was everything under the sun from people using their hashtag, their Twitter feeds, to custom hardware in the back of the seat, and we realized that you know we were just going to go out and do it, and we were going to figure out how to patent the checkout process, because we know you came to enjoy a game and drink a beer, and we're asking you to put your credit card information, and there's a learning curve to that. So we're really focused on patenting the checkout process, not necessarily the mobile vending. Any other questions? Jack? How do you serve this? I mean, does, does the Great question. Great question. So a lot of competitors came into the market, and they overpromised and underdelivered. We have a marriage between our technology and the service. I make the joke that I'm the chief delivery boy because I'm in the stadium. I'm working out the logistics. I'm hands-on. Um, Entrepreneurship 101, we figured out the logistics portion, and now we're basically transitioning the workforces from these pilots that we do to handing off the platform so that they can do it operationally. Next up is uh, Kevin Kessler. Uh, Assist Bio is a company that builds proprietary software tools and uses them to facilitate the industrial pharmaceutical development process by providing clients 
virtual laboratory services that allow them to avoid physical testing on unpromising lines of research and focus their efforts on the paths most likely to bear fruit. Kevin? Aha. Quit moving around on me, Kevin. Sorry about that. <laughs> Assist Bio has its foundation in the lab of Dr. Bill Kaufman at the University of North Carolina. While studying melanoma, Bill had an insight about the important role of a certain metabolic pathway played in the development of cancer. This co coincided with the rise of the new field of systems biology, the study of how complex behaviors emerge from the interaction of individual biological elements. As a mathematical biologist, I had the skills to help Bill exploit his insight. We created a mathematical model of the cellular subsystem that Bill believed crucial to the understanding of melanoma. This model was, and still is, the largest and most complex of its type in the literature. Though this application proved useful, it was cost prohibitive. Believing this problem could be overcome by managing the complexity inherent in these models, I decided to try and develop software tools to make this approach commercially feasible. Proof of concept was established, demonstrating that this technique could be made more cost efficient. A team with the scientific, programming, business, and entrepreneurial expertise necessary to implement this project was assembled. We are currently developing the proprietary software at the heart of AssistBio's value proposition and working to bring this innovative technology to market and provide the company with a sustained competitive advantage. Systems biology techniques can be applied to the development of new medicines. Drug development requires that pharmaceutical companies spend hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars, on research and development for every drug that succeeds in earning an FDA approval. Furthermore, some medicines contain multiple chemicals, and testing all of the possible combinations physically is impractical. AssistBio is using the technology we've developed to create the Simple Cell Virtual Laboratory Service. This service will use predictive modeling to provide clients with simulated experimental results, allowing them to concentrate their physical experiments on combinations of compounds most likely to lead to successful drugs. This will reduce the number of bench experiments and speed the development process, resulting in medicines getting through the approval process more economically and with longer usable patent lifetimes. AssistBio is currently working towards using its models, proprietary tools, and expertise to determine a combination of agents that could form a drug that would make radiation and chemotherapy more effective in the treatment of melanoma. Simple Cell would provide any company interested in developing such drugs with a head start and a significant development cost savings. If any of you have advice that would help us complete the last leg of the road from research to industrial application, we would like to talk to you at the reception. Any questions, judges? As you talked about making it, uh, we're proving that it's more economical. Can you explain a little bit more about your business model and, and what have you proven that that is true? Uh, so we have proven this, this methodology works in research. It's, it, it actually helps. We can actually do it and implement it. Um, we have proof of concept to, uh, at building software tools to make it more efficient so we can actually do this for a reasonable cost. And our next step is to do a feasibility study to show that we can use this um, to actually help in the, the drug development process, to help make a drug that will improve the, the treatment of melanoma with chemotherapy and radiation. So make chemotherapy and radiation more effective at killing tumors. Did that issue your question? No. <laughs> <laughs> so you gave the same answers you gave in your pitch, a lot of more, more efficient, less cost. That's not a, that's an assertion, not a true point. Yeah, I mean, so we just need to know more about it. So, so uh, we we prove it by by doing it, by using this this technology to actually help find a combination of chemicals that that we can use to treat an actual disease melanoma, and that's we haven't done that, but we're we're looking for the the resources to be able to accomplish that. So, are you doing genomic studies or? 
I am actually a mathematician. Uh, uh, the the uh, scientists I work with. Uh, this is this is all uh, biochemistry and microbiology. It's about the the proteins interacting in your cells that make everything go. So closer, to uh, closer to genomics, but uh, it's uh, mostly microbiology and cellular research. <coughs> okay, good. Thank you. All right, next up is uh, Marshall Quadja. Uh, Exodynamics is creating an exoskeleton for the spine. The exoskeleton is a smart, active, and responsive back brace. Marshall? Thank you. <clears throat> Good evening. My name is Marshall Quadja. I'm, I'm the Chief Commercial Officer at Exodynamics, a medical device company offering a novel solution in the Sorry, it's just moved that. In the um, back hair market, that hasn't really changed much in the, over the last century. The problem is, uh, today's braces are much like yesterday's in that they're either soft and don't provide much support like a corset, or they're hard plastic shells and completely immobilize you. Exodynamics is going to solve this problem by, providing, by, by revolutionizing back hair as we currently know it. Current back braces, as I mentioned, are somewhat ineffective. And our advantage is a device that will couple support with mobility. And um, we have a motion following technology that enables the device to reduce muscle strain. And it does this by transferring the weight of the torso to the hip or to the waist area. And this is done through a consistent, continuous support through a complete range of motion, basically an exoskeleton for the back. Looking at the market, 20% of the U.S. population experiences back pain, and there are about 250,000 back surgeries in the U.S. per year. For us, that translates into a market size of $1.25 billion. However, the device that I just described earlier is likely a class two device because of its therapeutic nature. Therefore, in order to um, develop a shortcut and mitigate that risk, we've identified, um, and to monetize our technology immediately, we've identified a beachhead market through our NSF iCourse program of interventional physicians themselves as our end user. And we've done this for three specific reasons. One is the simplest application of our technology, and it'll be a class one device because it'll be an ergonomic aid, not a therapeutic aid. Two, Physicians are an underserved niche, um, especially given the high incidence of back pain, more than double that of the general patient population. And three, uh, they have the highest willingness to pay. We're confident that our exoskeleton back brace will reduce the number of missed workdays and reduce the cost and productivity losses associated with back pain. This initial market is a $300 million market opportunity, and we can expand this to serve dentists and other healthcare practitioners before moving on to the sizable general patient market, which was a one and a quarter billion. Looking at the team, we're scientists, engineers, businessmen, and entrepreneurs. Our experience includes inventions in the medical device space, as well as a track record in successful startups. Currently, we're manufacturing a handful of commercially viable prototypes and we'll be piloting them in the next uh, couple of months. Moving forward, we're looking forward to launch our product, ramp up sales, um, expand our IP by aspects of telemedicine and um, mobility. Thank you. They said they were going to grill you because they're in the mood. Yeah, great. <laughs> All right. Any questions? Yes. Sure. Is this covered by insurance? So our, our long-term plan is that it will be available to the general patient market. And yes, we have, um, it, there's an insurance reimbursement co code already existing that we would be able to bill. Who's your greatest competitor? So the greatest competitor right now would be, if we're talking about the rehab market, um, people coming out of surgery it would be a hard plastic shell. Um, that they that they send patients home with, and we just had a, a conversation earlier today with how 
uh, ineffective and hateful they, they are to patients that we they were just talking about the, the, this page, this particular patient took it home and um, after they were done with it took it to a sort of a shooting range and put a whole bunch of bullets in the arch okay that's enough yeah. <laughs> so, so, so there is competition out there but patients want something else that's a, that's a whole different category <laughs> <Yeah>. Marshall <laughs> <laughs> I saw some ears per cow. It's bulletproof. Hey, yeah, I can use that. Um, Alex Vanderkook is up next. Uh, Alex is Mo Mountain Labs. Uh, it is a uh, software as a service company based in Ann Arbor, Michigan, that develops cloud hosted data management technology. Their uh, proprietary software, Simport, helps healthcare providers and research organizations securely collect organize and share structured data sets to automate HIPAA compliant data access and facilitate big data analytics. So with that, Alex. Hey there everybody, my name is Alex Vanderkolk. As my friend here mentioned, I'm the president and founder of Mountain Labs. Mountain Labs is a software as a service company that helps healthcare providers and research organizations aggregate and share data in an automated HIPAA compliant format. I know that's probably not the sexiest topic to listen to at 6.50 uh, in the evening, so I'm going to talk about how I, a 21-year-old and recent UM graduate, was able to develop this software, sell it to providers at two of the most advanced health systems in the world, and generate revenue all while still in beta over the past few months. So for the two years prior to my graduation, I was working as a data analyst in the Cancer Center at the University of Michigan Health System. Uh, and my first project, I was working with Dr. Jennifer Griggs to standardize treatment guidelines for breast cancer patients. Needless to say, I was really excited for this opportunity to work with hospitals, insurers, and most importantly, patients to optimize treatments in order to save money and improve outcomes. Now, my first day on the job, Dr. Griggs emailed me several spreadsheets with about 3,000 patient records in them that had been hand transcribed from three different locations with no discernible format and told me to fix it. Um, <laughs> this, this project was already two years behind schedule and several hundred thousand dollars over budget because this data was so unwieldy, so difficult to manage, and required so much time and effort. Uh, Electronic health record systems were touted as the go-to source for this data, but in reality, unfortunately, they're much more billing-oriented, very complex um, uh, data management systems. Now, on the other hand, uh, we are a much more flexible data management system that wants to capture the 66% of clinical data that is currently outside of the electronic health record systems. These uh, healthcare providers are already spending two and a half billion dollars per year to manage this data, and you still can't access it outside of the organization, nor can a non-technical user even inside the organization access it. So it's siloed, it's locked up, and we want to change that. So over the past uh, eight months, I put together a team of other bright young people, raised $350,000 in capital, including investments from the chief of hematology and oncology at Huron Valley Sinai Hospital and a former lead software developer at Thomson Reuters Healthcare Analytics. Since then, we've been developing our cloud-hosted software, which replaces spreadsheets and email attachments with structured, machine-readable online databases. Um, as you can tell, there's uh, several colleagues here who are starting digital health companies. It's a huge sector. It's, it's rapidly growing, but there's no mechanism to get the data to the right place at the right time in the right format. We provide that mechanism, and we're very excited to help brilliant people access better data faster. Thank you. All right, do we have any questions, judges? Well, you covered everything. Alex. That was really good. <laughs> Keep it good. simple. All right. You mentioned, which is surprising, that you're accessing a lot of data that is not included in the EMRs. Precisely. Right? What kind of data would that would that be? I mean, I would have thought that the EMRs would have all of her data. <laughs> 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 it is HIPAA compliant to, to address that, but that's a great question, and because there is such a wide variety of data, and this is generally data from remote monitoring systems, patient satisfaction surveys, so we provide a infrastructure for people to aggregate that data and then run algorithms over it. So figuring out which treatment was the most effective for a given patient and which treatment left the patients the happiest at the end. So anything and everything. 
Good question, John. All right. All right. Nick, Nick. Um, So have you validated that you said, talk about revenue? Uh, so you validated the willingness to pay. So can you talk about revenue? Yeah, of course. Yeah, that's, that's a great question. I think I might have forgotten to mention that. We're currently working uh, with research teams doing pilot projects at the University of Michigan Health System and University Hospitals in Cleveland, which is Case Western's Academic Medical Center, to analyze their... Uh, Ch their, their medical chart data and figure out whether or not certain types of oncologists lead to uh, increased readmission rates, similar to uh, my friends here at Health Numeric. So, yes, we validated it. We're selling it on a per-user, per-month basis right now um, to these organizations and are expanding to the west side of Michigan right now. All right, thank you. Thanks. So next up, Valerie uh, Ovenchain, uh, Advanced Interactive Response Systems, or AIRS, produces high-quality gas safety products that will improve patient health and caregiver performance. Oxygen system irregularities can lead to patient respiratory distress, hypoxia, damage to vital organs, and even premature death. AIRS addresses these issues by ensuring the proper amount of oxygen is being delivered. Well, While well, working to develop this presentation, I was told I only had 30 seconds to grab your attention. But what if your oxygen ran out? Would you be focused on me or your next breath? My name is Valerie, and I worked as a registered respiratory therapist for over a dozen years, and this is a real concern for those who rely on oxygen therapy. That's why I started Advanced Interactive Response Systems, also known as AIRS. Oxygen failure can be deadly. Oxygen delivery failures are results of issues such as a power outage, mechanical failure, and the oxygen supply just running out. Air systems address all of these issues. It only takes a matter of minutes without the proper amount of oxygen before a patient's life is severely at risk. Because of this, many oxygen users live in constant fear of issues with their oxygen supply. Airs has developed products for all oxygen sources to monitor pressure, flow, concentration. If, the, if there's an issue with the oxygen source, it sends alerts both local and remotely to the patient and the caregiver. They ensure that the proper amount of oxygen is being delivered and if there's an issue, it can automatically change to a backup oxygen supply if needed. Air systems offer continuous complete system monitoring. Last year, AIRS had a U.S. utility patent which was issued. We've also filed a patent continuation as well as a patent cooperation treaty which will allow us to file in other countries. This patent includes the use of these alarms with other pressurized gases, fluids, and flowable solids, which AIRS may license some of these other applications. AIRS, <laughs> AIRS has a global market for medical gas and equipment of seven billion dollars and growing. AIRS will first focus the nursing home market in Michigan. AIRS customers are the nursing homes, hospitals, and home care oxygen suppliers. AIRS has talked to many of these and has showed a great need and interest for these products. AIRS will use, um, AIRS has over, wait, there are 4.4 million oxygen users in the U.S. and healthcare is transitioning to um, telemedicine and air systems can help facilitate these goals. I know. <laughs> it's nerve wracking up here. Airs, sorry. Airs will use manufacturers to produce and ship their systems to distributors. We are currently working with distributors that specialize in respiratory products and telemedicine products as well. Airs will um, then you <laughs> um, air systems. I have personally funded airs for the patent work, prototypes, and consulting services. I have just received a quote for forty five hundred dollars for help with the FDA process. So I put the five thousand dollar price to good use. Air systems will save lives, money, and improve the quality of life for oxygen patients. These set systems can set a new standard for quality patient care. Thank you. She's been watching the Q&A to see her bolt for her seat. <laughs> Paula? How do you manage the liability? Um, I'm working with the company Brownrig right now for the insurance needs. 
Anything else, Jody? Uh, can you um, integrate your platform with the other telehealth platforms so that you know you work with other kinds of data information that, that people need to transmit to their physicians? Yes, I'm currently working with Health Net, Health Net Connect, which does just that, and they're, they're a big distributor, and I'm tying my system in with theirs. Very good. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Good job. And finally, uh, Andy Zimmerman. You remember Andy? He came late. If you remember. <laughs> From uh, Civionics. Uh, Civionix is bringing to market leading-edge wireless sensing systems that can provide manufacturers with advanced forewarning of equipment failure. Civionix core technology was developed at the University of Michigan and has been demonstrated on long-span bridges, U.S. Navy vessels, wind turbines, and in other challenging applications. Andy? So I'm... Thank you. I'm Andy Zimmerman. I'm the CEO at Civionix, and I'm, I'm really excited to be here tonight to tell you about our new industrial automation product that we think has the potential uh, to do to the auto industry what uh, Nest has done to the home automation market. So when I started Civionix a few years ago, as a spin out of my research at the University of Michigan, I had this vague recollection that there was an auto industry in Detroit and that it was a pretty big deal. Uh, but I didn't really realize the magnitude of that business until I had the chance last fall to walk the floor of uh, a stamping plant, one of the big three stamping plants uh, out in Warren. Uh, those facilities are amazing. I mean, they, they turn out parts 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. Um, and you know, what it, when it boils down to it, if one of their production lines goes down uh, due to some sort of unexpected failure, it can cost an automaker upwards of $600 per minute in lost revenue. So that's a, that's a pain point for the auto manufacturers. And you know, I started thinking if we could take Sibionics existing technology, which was developed at U of M to look for signs of damage in long span bridges, and we could apply it to monitoring industrial equipment looking for signs of damage, we could potentially have a product that by predicting a single piece of equipment failure could, could pay for itself basically for an infinity. Uh, so when we looked at this for, uh, from a, a little bit more quantitative perspective, we found that the automotive stamping market itself is about a $30, a $30 million market, um, and then tangential markets bring that up to right around a $300 million opportunity. So what makes our patent pending technology stand apart from what else is available is the fact that we take the smarts from a typical monitoring system and we embed them within our wireless sensing devices themselves. And that lets us seamlessly use the cloud to transmit actionable information. That's the kicker. Actionable information, not data, uh, to our, our customers. So clearly there's some competitors in this area. Siemens for one, it's pretty entrenched in the auto industry, but they make really expensive stuff. Um, it's very disruptive to install a lot of times and they don't necessarily leverage wireless the way that, that I think they should. Um, so our big challenge right now is to figure a way to get our technology uh, adopted by the, by the, the automakers. Um, fortunately, we've got an internal champion at two of the big three OEMs, as well as uh, the region's biggest electrical supplier. And we're confident that by early summer, we'll have a pilot project in place that you know, we can use as a reference to start growing our business uh, on a customer by customer basis. Um, uh, with that said, um, we've got a great team in place to bring that business to fruition. In addition to myself, my partner is a globally recognized thought leader in wireless sensing technology, uh, specifically for health monitoring applications. And we just uh, pulled Jerry Rossin's leg and he's become our, uh, our business development uh, lead. Um, over the last few years, we've done right around $300,000 in revenue yearly, but we're really hoping that this market gives us the opportunity uh, to grow exponentially. Thank you. Um, so if anybody here would help or would like to help Civionics become the nest of the industrial automation space, you know, uh, meet me at the table or give me a call. Thank you. All right. Any judges' uh, questions on this? Wow. Good job. Very thorough. Oh, come on. Ask me something. Do you have a cat? Uh, I don't. I'm, I'm actually allergic to cats. Oh, sorry. I didn't mean. They love me, though, so they sit on my head. Oh, wow. <laughs> they do that. What kind of pricing do you think you can get out of these in kind of general market? Yeah, that's a, that's a, yeah, that's a, a great question. Uh, we actually just had a meeting uh, this morning uh, with, with this large electrical supplier, um, and they actually gave us feedback that, that made us think we actually have maybe a bigger margin than we thought about. Um, our devices come in pretty low cost. Uh, we haven't 
decided on a price, but roughly at the you know the hundred to two hundred dollar range per per sensing node, which is capable of you know collecting a large amount of information. Um, so from a margin perspective, uh, you know, kind of depends on where that falls, but fifty to sixty percent. Yes. What do you think the length of your sales cycle? Yeah, uh, that's a good question. It, it depends on how we go about the sales. Um, you know, our initial uh, attempts were basically to go straight to the OEMs, um, and they showed a lot of interest. Two of the three are pretty much on board, but their sales cycle internally with a, you know, an unknown company is, is rather long. Um, what we found is maybe the better way in is to, to take a hold of an existing supplier um, that already pushes this type of technology into the auto industry and, and use that to bring about a much quicker sales cycle. Um, so that's, that's uh, kind of how we're positioning. Yeah, we, we do. Um, and that, again, was the, the meeting we had this morning. But, but he'll take suggestions. I, w I, would, I would love to. <laughs> so, okay, great. Very good. Thanks. Thank you. I want, uh, want to thank all of our presenters, students. You did a wonderful job. You made me proud tonight. Um, I, I would like to just kind of point out how difficult this really is to stand up in front of a crowd for maybe in some cases the first time and present your case. And then immediately you sit down and you think about the 4,000 things that you wanted to say while you were up here. But you did an admirable job. Nice job. At this point in time, we're going to take. Was this your, your first time? We're gonna, yes. You couldn't tell? <laughs> Um, we're going to take the judges and put them in a hermetically sealed room. <laughs> and if you come back with a good judgment, we'll unseal the room. And you can come back and announce the, uh, the winner in just a few minutes after our, our speaker. Thank you so much, judges. Big round of applause. We appreciate your time. All right, so if I could, students, take your seat back in the classroom here, and we'll call you back up uh, later. So with that, um, I want to uh, reintroduce the judges, and if you would, again, stand up, because they, they took valuable, valuable time to be here tonight, and, and we certainly appreciate that. Um, so if you would, if you're still here, Jack Aarons, give a wave and take a round of applause. Jack? Is, uh, is Terry still here? Terry? Terry Cross, thank you so much. <clears throat> Paula Cunningham, I see Paula back there. And did we lose uh, Jody Vanderwall, I think, who had to leave, and, and Nick Wurzler, but let's have a round of applause for them. Um, also, uh, for all of our presenters tonight, this is very tough. This is a tough crowd because they look out there and they know all of you have in some fashion had success or failures, which is simply a success disguised. And, and they know they're presenting in front of professionals and people who understand, so it's very difficult. And then to be grilled unmercifully like the judges did um, that makes it that makes it pretty tough so uh, congratulations to to all of our presenters tonight so let me invite to the stage from the Raymond group one of our major sponsors tonight uh, Chris Singh Chris if you would join me up here what Chris what do you have, <laughs> I have a check, Chris. that is a check for five thousand bucks all right all right so we're gonna give that to the winner and you are gonna step over here and tell us who that is I'm very proud to present the check tonight to an Ann Arbor winner. Narrows it a little bit, and that is Civionics, Andrew Zimmerman. Congratulations, Andrew. For a guy who came late to the competition, you didn't come late for the check. I like that. I think, let's shoot. Put him, yeah, right in the middle. Get in the middle. Don't, don't hand us at the drive What is that? <laughs> Congratulations. Thanks. 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 And all of you, thank you, and, and Diane and Mish and everybody at MyQuest, thanks for having me back. This is one of my favorite evenings of the year, and I really appreciate it. It's been great sharing the evening with all of you. Go out and have a prosperous year. Thank you. Congratulations to our winner, and I'd like to invite all of you, if you're interested, you are welcome to join us in the Afterglow uh, reception, which is just back in the exhibit hall. Most of the exhibitors are gone, but uh, there are some refreshments and a cash bar, so um, we'll be here until 9 o'clock.
thank you for coming this evening and have a safe trip home. Once again, I had a good job. That's fun. Oh,